So yes, I'm a freakishly tall ginger. Good evening. Um, nerds, we need to talk, okay? Uh, we have a problem. I love being a scientist. I love what I do. I think it's amazing. And on top of that, I really love being a scientist because I love TED. I mean, if you think about it, you can see some of the greatest communicators in all of science on TED's website, right? Hundreds of talks, right? And one of the common themes that they have is that they always feature someone that is instantaneously communicative and also can communicate ideas well. But even the best TED speaker cannot hold a candle to this guy. <laughs> That's right, Mr. American Idol, Ryan Seacrest, arguably the hardest working man in all of show business. And importantly, not a scientist. His message is received by millions of people every day, and he does it really well. He communicates really well, and that's his only job, and importantly, not a scientist. Uh, do we have any scientists here? Anyone? Raise your hands. Anyone want to be one? I, I like it. All right. Well, I'm going to make a strong argument that all of you are scientists in one way, shape, or form. Have any of you ever prepared a, a dish? Have you cooked before? Yeah, of course. Of course, right? Well, that's just chemistry where you get to eat the results, right? Ah, that's right. <laughs> I got my bad joke in. All right. Uh, if you've ever wondered about the world, uh, wondered why it is the way it is, you're doing what scientists do every day, except we just test it. That's the only difference. So we're all scientists in that respect. So one of the things I want to analyze is figure out why Ryan Seacrest is so good at what he does, because we can learn from the entertainment industry in science and how we communicate. So if we look at biology, uh, if you look at Ryan's face, he has, a, he has really high bilateral symmetry. Okay? So if you could fold his face over, it would match up really well with the other side. That indicates, kind of in general, good health, genetic virility, and prime mating. Uh, chemistry, represented here by uh, Linus Pauling, who I'll note, by the way, won not just one, but two Nobel Prizes. So think of that next time you're having an unproductive day. Uh, chemistry... <laughs> chemistry... So when you watch American Idol, Ryan is very good at cultivating your emotions. He makes you feel happy or sad for the people on stage, right? And so that builds on evolutionary synaptic connections, and he's very good at playing off of what you already know and how your emotions are. Mathematics, we go with that. If you work with him, you will have a high probability of profiting from his talent and his brand, right? And physics, well, physics would say that he's short. So, anyone here, can anyone here name a living scientist? Shocking. <laughs> That's sad. Okay, does anyone know who these gentlemen are? Well, when this photo was taken, these were the only members of Congress who had an advanced degree in any sort of scientific field. They all happen to have a degree in physics. But if I, uh, depending on the uh, survey that you use, less than a quarter of all Americans can confidently state that they know a living scientist. And no, Al Gore does not count. <laughs> that was a top answer. And no, Albert Einstein does not count. Note, I said living. Again, another top answer in the, in the survey. But if I throw this picture up, if you're between the ages of 18 and 29, there's an exceptionally high chance that you know this is Mark Zuckerberg, the creator of Facebook. Now, why do we know him and not scientists? Well, he created a tool that is meant to communicate. And that's sad, because science, if you think about it, is actually the most creative endeavor we humans do. It's an exceptionally right-brained activity. Why? Because you have to fundamentally create something that doesn't exist. You create knowledge. And in that respect, it's a lot more similar to art and music than it is to, say, something like politics. So, <laughs> we've got a problem, nerds. You all may be the best at what you do, right? You may be an excellent scientist. But there's a problem. We just need to admit that we suck at communicating. And so we need to fix this. And there's a way we can do it. And we can use Ryan, uh, uh, Ryan Seacrest's ability as a communicator to do and help us in this process. So we need to analyze why the problem exists in the first place. And one problem is that science is tough. And this makes it hard to communicate. If you think about it, you spend four years in undergrad, five in some of your cases, five to seven years in a doctoral program, and then, of course, some sort of postdoctoral training to become good at what you do. 
right? So at that point, you've gone past the big picture, and now, at this point, it's all about details. Modern scientific research is about nuance. So science is tough, and for most people, details are boring, okay? But the best part about science is that it's contagious. It inspires wonder in us. And so we need to remember that when we talk about, when we're communicating science. Also, one of the problems is that science has moved away from what I'll call the human scale and moved more towards the extremes, the cosmological and the molecular, okay? So the low-hanging fruit of science has really been solved. Structure of DNA, fundamental forces of the universe, what have you, those have been worked out in generations past. Now we're mired in the details. And it takes a lot of time to understand and explain them to people. The other problem is that science has become increasingly interdisciplinary. So the more disparate fields appear to each other, often the better the results that you get. I can't imagine this would be any more uh, surprising. And if I actually showed you a picture here, this is an owl and what it looks like without its feathers. If someone had told me this majestic creature of Harry Potter land looks like a, a cartoon vul uh, vulture, I would think you're crazy. So it's really important to note, <laughs> nature does not care what you think about it. So science can be very counterintuitive. Another issue, people's attention has become more valuable. We receive information in fractured forms. Phones, computers, Facebook, te television. So unless the Earth sp uh, spins out of the, uh, on the, around the orbit of the, uh, the sun and also slows down on its axis, we're gonna have to continue dividing up our time in, in smaller and smaller bites. And that's just not gonna happen. So I wanna introduce the concept of the niche expert. And you all can be one in your particular field. It doesn't have to be science. But you're someone who sees the big picture in your area. It's hard to see the big picture across fields. And we'll show you that Ryan Seacrest is very good at seeing the big picture across all of entertainment, as well as the science experts we're gonna to get to in a second. And what we wanna do is turn that niche expert into a niche communicator, someone that we can call upon at a moment's notice to explain the wonders of the world to the masses. So how do we do that? As I said earlier, our forms of communication have been fractured, right? It's not so much that you can just post a, a scientific study online and hope that people understand it. You have to tweet the impact of the study, Facebook the abstract, blog about the details, uh, interview the scientists on Hulu, and then tell the stories about how it's positively impacted people's lives on XM. And you have to do this at the appropriate time for the appropriate person in the appropriate format. That takes a lot of work. So it's a lot easier if you are in your own field. Now I wanna introduce you to Dr. Carl Sagan, uh, the man, in my opinion. And he's from a generation past, and he's probably the best scientific communicator that we have ever had, in my opinion. I don't know if you've he ever read anything by him. It's totally worth the read. So what made Do Dr. Sagan so good at what he does? Well, he was a failed scientist, for all intents and purposes. He was denied tenure. He got picked up by Cornell. And then he went on to help design the Voyager spacecraft that is now still at the edge of our solar system sending back information. And this is 30 years ago. He also was charged with designing the language that went on a gold plaque that was released into space that would tell any alien race where we are in, this, in the universe. Talk about a communication nightmare, right? But he also did something else. He was as comfortable speaking in allegory as he was in reality. He could speak about physics as well as he could speak about biology. And that made him very good at what he did. So Ryan Seacrest can, only, can also only talk in all of the formats as well. He speaks in TV, radio, and the internet. He's mastered all of them, and I know he has a huge team of people that help him. But he's able to speak across all formats of communication. Carl Sagan did this a generation ago without the internet. And he also was very good at what he did. So there's one, one thing we have to remember. If we're gonna become a better communicator, we have to borrow from what uh, noted uh, science communication expert and writer Chris Mooney has said, we have to reframe issues. And what does this really mean? It means you have to teach your audience how to bond with information. And this really amounts to branding. Yes, I said it. You have to borrow from the business world. Marketing, business, entertainment, they know how to brand information. And what does that really mean? It means it 
it, they want you to know how information makes you feel. Because evidence doesn't speak for itself. Science is not performed in a cultural vacuum. So how can we do this, okay? You don't have to believe me, per se. I'm not talking about spin, either. I'm just talking about how does information make one feel. It does have an impact on how you perceive it. So we'll just do a quick little test. How does this image make you feel? Familiar, warm, jolly, thirsty? It's familiar is my point. You know this is a Coke ad. I don't have to put the word up there, right? What about this? Alien, unsure, the matrix? What if I told you this was uh, an E. coli bacterium, a scanning electron micrograph of one, actually it's dividing, uh, one bacterium. It's a common bacterium, relatively harmless, and it lives in your gut. You'd be dead without it, it'd be dead without you. Now what if I told you that we put a gene into that bacterium that allowed it to produce human insulin? And then we could take that insulin out, purify it, and use it to treat diabetes of a loved one. That's a real product, and it's called humulin. And that really does occur, and that's how we make insulin. Does it change your perception of it? One more. Just like, what the hell is that? <laughs> what if I told you these are human embryonic stem cells, and in fact, that's what they are. There's about 1,000 of them growing in the center right there. Now, what if I told you you could put a gene into those that would prevent and correct Parkinson's or Alzheimer's? Now, since they're stem cells, and they're pluripotent, meaning they can make any type of tissue in the body, we can then turn them into brain cells, neurons, and then use them to treat or prevent Parkinson's in a loved one. Does that change your perception of them? Hopefully it does, even if it makes you angry. <laughs> My point is, context matters when you're presenting information. And you can't just deliver the evidence. You have to consider how the, how the data makes someone feel. And this, again, science is a product and it deserves to be branded just like anything else you consume. And it can be done in a, in a responsible way because we can apply branding to the reasoned world of science. And I'll, we'll tell you, we get to, Carl Sagan was amazing at this. He knew how data made people feel. So if we put Ryan Seacrest together with Carl Sagan, we create a, a chimera that I'll call Sagan Crest. <laughs> Be, because it was late at night, and frankly, I was a little tired. Um, and what we want to do, though, is we can learn from both of them. They both mastered their fields as global communicators, OK? And we can apply this as niche communicators of science. Ryan Seacrest doesn't care so much about what you think. He cares about what you feel when he's on stage. And Carl Sagan did the same thing, except he applied it to the reason world of science. The one thing they shared was expertise. And at our organization, Thirst, uh, we choose emotive language for a reason, because it helps our, our audience members bond with the information they're being presented, and ultimately having better conversations and driving a better interest in science. So we can learn from both of them. So maybe what we need is a legion of Sagans from a generation past. And without Sagan, by the way, you wouldn't have Bill Nye the Science Guy. You wouldn't have Miss Frizzle in the Magic School Bus. Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Greene, or even Family Guy. Yes, Seth MacFarlane is a big Carl Sagan fan. Uh, so he has had a huge impact on the scientific field. So how do we do this? Well, we need you guys to be a legion of niche expert communicators in whatever you do. Um, to practice your field and be able to be plucked out and communicate when you need to. And the other reason is I just don't want Neil deGrasse Tyson getting all the credit anymore. I mean, he is so good at his job. That's not true. He's actually a really nice guy. So the, the, anyway, my point is wonder fuels the fire of science, all right? You have to think big picture in science. And it's not about the details, even though it seems that way. And the other thing, <laughs> science is a product, just like anything else. But you don't have to be dishonest about it. It's not dishonest to, to consider how your data makes you, the audience feel. It's just knowing your audience. So with that in mind, um, I want you guys to become the niche experts. We're about changing paradigms here, at TED, especially at TEDx Foggy Bottom. And whatever you do, be utterly fascinating. Because ideas are often born out of necessity, but passion motivates the journey. So we can learn from Carl Sagan. We can learn from Ryan Seacrest and put their talents together. And so what we can do, and borrow from science and say, refine the model, be better. Let's be better than Sagan. Hell, let's just be better. Thank you. <laughs>